Hebrews chapter 9, and we left off last time with verse 15 at the beginning of this section, verses 15 through 24 today. And we mentioned that many new versions and the supposed scholars who promote them have changed the word testament, verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament, to the word covenant. And I mentioned that the word covenant emphasizes the terms um, of agreement between two living parties. You do this, and then I will do that. We agree with each other. The word testament, however, refers to those things that only go into effect after the death of the one who has established them. Notice verse 16 once again. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And the first part of verse 17, for a testament is of force after, after men are dead. That is your last will and testament. What's going to happen? How are your belongings and your possessions going to be dispersed uh, after you die? Verse 20 states, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. To enjoin means to command or to prescribe for others to follow. And the reference there, however, is to verses 18 and 19, just before it, uh, and the activities of the Levites in the book of Exodus and also in the book of Leviticus. Let's read verses 18 and 19 again. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of, the, of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Observe verse 19. Uh, the book is said to be sprinkled as well as the people. The book would be the continuing record of God's dealing with Israel at the time of Moses. Undoubtedly, Moses was keeping some sort of a journal and a record of all of God's dealings with the nation of Israel. And since the life of the flesh is in the blood, according to Leviticus 17, verse 11, if God was going to give to the world a book, it would be a living book. It would be a living book. We believe that it is. Uh, Hebrews 4, um, ver well, actually, let me have you go back there. Hebrews chapter 4. And verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick. That's old English. It means alive. For the word of God is quick. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What is? The word of God. It can read your mind. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Bible is described as having personality, able to read your mind. And this is the person, this is the one with whom we have to do. I mentioned recently, our religion is the most spiritual of all because it doesn't depend upon candles and incense and statues and images and special vestments and garments for the priest, special haircuts, special directions you have to pray in, special postures of the body. It doesn't depend on any of that. And God saw fit to give us only one physical tangible object we hold in our hands and by which we communicate with God and he communicates back to us. That's the book by his providence. Otherwise, you don't need anything else. Listen, if you spend your life studying this, you'll exhaust yourself before you learn the Bible. You don't need a collection of Bibles, new translations. You don't need all of the physical trappings of organized religion or man-made religion what you need is the book God has provided and the salvation offered by Jesus Christ. And then after that, the Holy Spirit becomes your teacher. You compare Scripture with Scripture, that the Scriptures interpret, excuse me, interpret themselves. So this is Him with whom we have to do. So 
Um, if God was going to give the world a book, it would be a living book. And the words scripture and scriptures nowhere refer to some undiscovered original manuscripts. Let me have you look at a few uh, other texts. Go back, if you will, to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Luke, chapter 4. Notice verses 20 and 21. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He wasn't referring to any originals uh, or any ancient manuscripts that no one had found that were penned by Moses or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, any of the prophets. He was referring to the scriptures that he had just read. Go forward, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 5. John 5. Uh, verse 39. Notice what Christ says here. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Well, you can't search the scriptures if you don't have access to them. The, reference, the scriptures are a reference to the copies of the Bible a person held in his hand or he had access to at the synagogue. It was not never a reference to any long-lost uh, ancient manuscripts. Do you know the common belief and the common thing propagated by modern day Bible scholars is that 200, between 200 and 250 years before Christ, a group of Jewish scribes decided to translate the Bible uh, from Hebrew into Greek during the time of the Greek Empire. Art under, um, I think, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the king, Ptolemy, I think. And uh, they, they said, I think it was six, six scribes from every one of the 12 tribes, which would come to 72, but they round it off and call it the 70. And their word for that is Septuagint. And so they claimed that they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, and then through the Greek empire, and later the Roman, it was more widely disseminated throughout the world, and that in the time of Jesus, this was the translation that Christ and his disciples were reading and were read in the synagogues, this Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And yet God had given the Levites uh, exclusive responsibility to safeguard the scriptures and safeguard the things uh, written by God or inspired by God. And if God, any translation made by the other tribes would not be accepted by God. But that never stopped the scholars from maintaining their, their myth. There's never been any BC copy of the scriptures in Greek ever discovered. Uh, and the, the oldest copies of the scriptures in Greek uh, that have ever been found, weren't written until about 300 A.D. But they perpetuate this myth that there was this Greek translation of the time of Jesus, and uh, the Bible read by Christ and his disciples was that Greek translation. I'll come back to that idea in a little bit. But also go, if you will, to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, notice here, verse, uh, oh, verse, verses 34 and 35. Here, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8, verses 34 and 35, and the eunuch answered Philip 
and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet of the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He wasn't taking him to refer him to the original manuscripts. He was referring him to the scripture the Ethiopian was sitting up in his chariot reading. That was the scripture. That's why I said if God was going to produce a book, it would be a living book able to survive no matter what language it was translated into by God's providence. Go, if you will, to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 and verse 11. Acts 17, 11, meaning the Bereans. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Well, they could only search the scriptures they held in their hands, the ones they had access to. They didn't have the original manuscripts. They didn't have something written by Isaiah or Jeremiah. They didn't have any of the original writings penned by the uh, Old Testament writers. They had whatever copies God saw fit to provide them in their day, and he called that scripture. And Paul said it was able to make thee wise unto salvation. Let's go, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. And verse... 15, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says in verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now notice verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so forth and so on. Uh, The scripture, in this case, is the copies of the scriptures Timothy had access to. Whatever his mother taught him, whatever he heard read in the synagogues, if he went to synagogue with his mother, uh, and that was the only scripture he had access to. He didn't have access to the originals. He wasn't taught by the original writings uh, of anyone. He was taught and learned about God from the scriptures, Paul says, and that was not a reference to any original manuscripts. But you think that would be abundantly clear to so many people, but not anymore. Let me read to you something that I wrote several years ago, and I decided to put it in my book right inside the the front cover. I called it, What is a Bible Believer? I sat down, and I thought, well, I want to simplify the definition of a Bible believer. And all of a sudden, all of this text just started coming out of my mind without any effort. The term Bible believer is easy to define. One who believes that the copies of the Old Testament and New Testament, which he holds in his hands and reads in his own language, are the words of God, entirely correct, and without any need of improvement, is a Bible believer. His job is not to correct the Bible. The Bible's job is to correct him. By contrast, one who holds that only the original manuscripts are the inspired words of God is not a Bible believer. The originals have never been found and cannot be consulted. Expressions such as the original text or the original writings are therefore meaningless. Someone who holds that the original manuscripts were the inspired words of God, but no such claim can be made for a translation, is also not a Bible believer. When the writers of the Greek New Testament quoted from the Hebrew Old Testament, and by the way, they did that nearly 200 times as you go through the New Testament. You'll find quotations from the Old Testament. When they quoted from the Hebrew Old Testament, didn't they have to translate? And if the entire Old Testament had been translated into Greek two centuries before the time of Christ, that's the Septuagint, by this definition, the entire Bible read by Christ and his disciples was not inspired either. Someone who thinks that all versions of the Bible contain the essential doctrines of of Christ and favoring one over another is a matter of opinion is likewise not a Bible believer. 
He thinks his own judgment and reasoning skills are the final authority in scriptural matters. Someone who claims that one specific version is the Word of God, a lot of fundamentalists do, they'll say the King James Bible is the Word of God, with just a few errors in it that need correction, is certainly not a Bible believer. The presence of even one mistake would constitute an imperfect Bible. If there is one error, perhaps there are many. It would no longer be possible to define the term Bible believer as given above. I am a Bible believer. Are you? That's what I wrote. And pat myself on the back, I think it came out very well. But this book is a bloody book. It starts describing the shedding of blood in the first book, Genesis chapter 4. You don't get to chapter 4 without the first mention of blood being shed, the coats of skins that God made to cover their nakedness. And it doesn't end until Revelation 20, the end of the millennium, when the nations of the world try to withstand and fight against Jesus Christ, and he just wipes them out. And uh, around the edges of a King James Bible, and I'll, I brought a couple for example. Here's a King James Bible I found at a thrift store a couple weeks ago. It's got gold edging on the pages. And that, for you and I, that's a symbol of the gold that overlaid all the furniture in the tabernacle. It's a royal book. It's a divine book. And if not that, by the way, here's a uh, um, Hangul King James, Sungkyung Korean King James Bible. Gold edging on the pages, just like the one in English. We don't call it the King James Bible for nothing. It's a royal book. Uh, and if not gold edging, it may have red edging. Uh, i got an example of that here. This is an old Schofield reference Bible, 1909. You can see it's got red edging on the pages. So it's a bloody book. It reminds us of the blood that was commanded and shed throughout the Old Testament, culminating in the death of Christ and his blood at Calvary, and the slaughter of those opposing Jesus Christ under the man of sin and the battle of Armageddon, and the nations are still wanting to oppose Christ at the end of the millennium. You read about that in Revelation 20. The modern versions can't compete with it. They can't compete with it. Um, turn, if you will, to Revelation 5. Revelation 5, and I want you to notice verse 1. Revelation 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. The King James Bibles have had ridges along the spine, uh, approximating seven seals of a divine book. Um, now, you're, the copy of the Bible you might have today might not have this included, but for so many years, if you count the top and the bottom, you, you see these little ridges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's been on the Bible for decades. They published that spine, they, or rather, they produce that spine with that. I, I doubt very seriously if anyone in a publishing company knows why they publish the covers that way, but they do. I found, um, actually, I think I have it here. No, I don't have it here. Here's an old King James Bible. Um, very soft, what they call leatherette, which is a fancy way for a cardboard with a shiny cover on it. <laughs> but uh, inexpensive, King James Bible, 
um, red letter edition, and it's got red edging on the pages. This has got some wear and tear, and it's been around several years here at the church. Got uh, Brother Bentley's name in there uh, to give to teenagers, new kids that get saved many years ago. And uh, But these are very inexpensive, three or four bucks, and it makes it easy to buy them and give them out to some new Christian just gets saved. He, he wants to learn the Bible. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I was very happy that Brother Manuel um, was willing to give his Bible away to someone that didn't have a Bible. And so I bought him a, a good uh, Ruckman reference Bible. Don't give that one away, brother, because <laughs> you get another one, you're on your own after that. But, <clears throat> but uh, and, and here's, what, here's what all the new Bibles used to do. <clears throat> here's the message by Eugene Peterson. This paperback, um, it just looks like something you'd see in the fiction section uh, at Barnes & Noble. That's because it largely is fiction. Um, and it's a paraphrase. He simply rewrites it in his own words. There's no markings indicating verses. It's just a straight, it's just a com continuing text. And similar to that is this one. It was called The Way. This was the Living Bible. This is, goes back to the 1970s, this cover here. And <clears throat> you can tell from the pictures of the teenagers or on the front cover, this was in the 70s, judging by the guy's haircut in there. And um, nothing particularly resembling the King James Bible at all. But now you go to Christian bookstores, you'll find the Living Bible resembling a King James Bible. They had to put a soft uh, leather, a leather cover on it or a black cover on it and maybe uh, gild the edges with gold and replace this uh, regular 40-pound, uh, no, not 40, not 20-pound weight paper with a thinner paper, but they replace it with an India paper like the King James Bible has. So it resembles a Bible, and then they create a concordance in the back of the, the book to explain what they've done. They have, to, they have to copycat, they have to imitate the appearance of a King James Bible. Here's another interesting thing. <clears throat> For so long, and oh, by, by the way, before I go that, here's a New American Standard version, uh, very similar to the, the soft cover um, King James Bible I showed you a minute ago. But this started out as a big paperback thing as well, back in the early 1960s. And they used to, we would always refer to the King James Bible as the Bible. And then when they started translating modern renditions, they referred to it as the Revised Standard Version, or the Revised Version back in 1881. The Revised Version, and then in 1901, the American Standard Version, and then in 1952, the Revised Standard Version. And then around 1964, the New American Standard Version. And then the New International Version, about 1978. And then they came along with the New King James Bible, 1982. But then after that, they've got the living, a number of other translations. So they kept referring to our book as the Bible, and all of these others as versions. And then Madison Avenue, the advertising experts, uh, tried to figure out the, the psychological impact or the influence that certain words trigger. So now they market these things, as it says on the front cover, the New American Bible. And they refer to ours as the King James Version. They took the terms, they just simply switched places so that you're supposed to think this is more authoritative than the book that's been around for 400 years. How could a book survive for 400 years, be the world's bestseller of any book ever written in the history of planet Earth, and yet nobody is controlling its printing and distri distribution and so forth, and it's remained essentially unchanged? The, the 
differences between one printing and another printing are so um, inconsequential that you can't really discuss it. They amount to nothing. And yet uh, the new international version has had about at least two updates since 1978. Now it's called the Today's international, New International Version, where they've changed the gender pronouns and to be more inclusive for you know, males, females, and whatever other category people put themselves in these days. It's in the Living Bible, same thing. It's no longer a paperback. It's got a nice uh, soft leather cover on it, and they refer to it as a Bible and refer to ours as a version. I like what uh, J. Vernon McGee said when they refer to that as the Living Bible. They're suggesting that my Bible must be dead. Are you kidding me? Kenneth Taylor's um, monstrosity couldn't stand up against the King James Bible at all. He writes, uh, he wrote that his intention for writing, rewriting the Bible in paraphrase, simply putting it into his own words, was so that his children at home would be able to understand it more easily. I guess he didn't have much confidence in them learning King James English and having it explained to them. But in the, in the living, quote-unquote, living Bible, you'll find Saul calling his son Jonathan an S-O-B. And he didn't, par he didn't abbreviate like I just did. You'll find the words son of a, you, right in the Bible. And uh, rather than Elijah or, or telling the prophets of Baal, cry aloud, maybe your God is out on a journey or, uh, and so forth, they say, maybe your God is out sitting on the toilet. Real flowing, graceful language for the Bible. Is that what you want your children to read, Mr. Taylor? But it's just been a big smoke and mirrors deception. And all the modern versions are simply copycat counterfeits of the King James Bible. What other Bible has survived with no copyright on it? If God was going to give to the world a book, that would be a perfect book without any need for update or change, who would be in charge of it? Who, own, who would own the copyright to it? Nobody. Nobody on the earth would be worthy of that. And yet, you'll read in the front of those Bibles that... Um, you're limited on how many verses you can quote. No more than 500 verses at a time can be quoted without giving due recognition to the publishing company um, or getting permission from the publishing company to, to include more than 500 verses in a quote for a publication or some such thing. They want to tightly control who owns the copyright to it. So Tyndale publishes their versions over here. Then Thomas Nelson publishes different versions here. And the, the Regency Publishers publishes uh, different translations here. And then you have Cambridge publishing more than one version of the Bible. Oxford publishing one, more than one version of the Bible. And then you have uh, Wycliffe publishing different translations of the Bible. But all of those companies print King James Bibles. And they don't need to consult or ask each other for permission because nobody owns the copyright to it. Anybody can print the King James Bible and distribute it without needing permission from anyone. That's because it's the word of God. It's not restricted by the control of the words of men or the influence of men. Now back to the word testament rather than covenant. The objective to the translation of testament rather than covenant is that Moses was still alive when uh, the testament, we might call it the Old Testament for lack of a better term, uh, was in effect. But notice that Christ, as the testator, verse 16, is compared to calves and goats down there in verse 19. Also verse 25 uh, summarizes that rather well. So verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself 
often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, meaning the calves and the goats and the bulls and the lambs. So he wasn't being compared to Moses uh, and the New Testament. He was being compared to the blessings that would flow if someone was obedient to slaying the animals in the Old Testament. And I'll, I'll repeat it again. I've repeated it many times, but in the Old Testament, a man's righteousness was measured, it was established in the eyes of God by his obedience to the laws and commandments, which included sacrifice every time he committed a sin. And this had to be maintained up until death, Ezekiel 18. The Jews, or Moses told the Jews, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. That's how a man's righteousness was established. <clears throat> In <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist's parents, still living before the birth of Christ in Old Testament times, it said they were both righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And like I say, it had to be maintained until death, according to Ezekiel 18. If you turn and commit wickedness and iniquity, all the good that you've done before will be forgotten. In your sins and in your iniquities, you would die, the Bible says there. And so <clears throat> someone was considered a righteous man by his obedience to the laws and the commandments and, and doing what he was told by, the, by Moses and the prophets. But that righteousness would only get him so far. It would get him after death to a place we call the place of comfort or Abraham's bosom. What he needed was a sacrifice that was greater than all the animals. And he would then receive eternal righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is eternal. It didn't begin at a certain place. It, doesn't, it won't end anywhere. It was always eternal, then was embodied in a man walking here on the earth for 33 and a half years. And he died as a substitute for the sinner. And when the sinner understands that Christ was the perfect man dying for him who is imperfect, he says, I put all my sins on Christ. His righteousness is then accredited to me. And a great spiritual transaction takes place. You go from sinner to saint that fast. And um, now... When you die, you don't have to go to some place in the heart of the earth waiting for a better sacrifice to be made on your... The best, the perfect sacrifice was already made. So he opened the way straight into heaven. And that's part of the blessing that flows from the New Testament rather than the Old Testament. And like I say, the word testament is much better than covenant. Covenant is about two people agreeing to do this and do that. You obey these commandments, God would give, grant, your, grant you forgiveness. In the New Testament, Christ died for this, your sake even before you believed in him. And simply believing on him, you have everlasting life, trusting in him. But um, then the writer summarized all of this. Look at verses 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, like the blood of goats and calves and so forth. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And God now, Christ now appears in the presence of God for us, and I'm going to conclude by having you go forward to 1 John, just a few pages, 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. An advocate, that's your defense attorney. He's pleading your, your case. He's defending your virtue. He's defending your status. He's defending your righteousness because you've trusted in Christ. 
So when the, the, the devil, who is referred to as your enemy, uh, tries to say, well, God, how can you let that guy into heaven? How can you accept that guy? Don't you see what he just did? He says he's a Christian. You see what he just did? Or that woman, how can you accept her into heaven? Don't you see what she just did? And you know what you commanded against those such, such things in the Old Testament. When he tries to accuse you, he's called the accuser of the brethren. Christ Jesus steps up and says, his perfect righteousness has already been credited to that man or that woman as a Christian. So that no matter what sin your flesh may commit, it can never drag your soul to hell. You're on your way to heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Part of you, don't ask me to fully explain it because I, I don't fully understand it myself. But part of you is already seated in the third heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you trusted Christ to save you, your dead spirit was made alive and joined with the Holy Spirit of God so that you and I are one. If your spirit was joined to the Holy Spirit, as mine was and every other Christian's was, then by the Holy Spirit, you and I are knit together. We are connected together by him. Without salvation, without the Holy Ghost dwelling in the believer, you are not united with an unbeliever. But once you get saved, you're, you're, you're united with every Christian who's ever been saved as well. The things you do in the flesh can affect the destination of your soul. Thank God for that. What a blessing that is. You know, eternal security is one of the most, I think, under stated blessings that come from salvation. We need to emphasize it more often. The opposite of eternal security has to be eternal insecurity. Maybe I lost it. Maybe I'm, it's in jeopardy because of something I did. Listen, and we say this to be dramatic, but to make a point. Someone will ask, well, you mean to tell me if Adolf Hitler had turned to Jesus Christ, after all the things he did, God would still forgive him and save him if he meant business with God? Yes, that's exactly what we mean to tell you. You're not the judge. God's the judge. He sees the heart. All you can see is the outward appearance. He knows if the person is sincere as a sinner who recognizes his need to be forgiven and recognizes when they're not sincere, when they don't mean business with God. A lot of people play games with the gospel and pretend like they're praying to get saved, and uh, they want the benefits <clears throat> or the blessings that come from hanging around Christians, but they don't want to be one. Do you mean to tell me that? Yes, that's exactly what we mean to tell you. Now, either you wrap your mind around that or just go ahead and be lost. Go ahead and stay lost. Either you're going to admit that what Jesus Christ offers is more powerful than, than the, the influence, the effect of any sin that's ever been committed, or you're just going to be ignorant for the rest of your life. And that's what we mean to say, that the blessings that come from the death of the perfect testator is eternal righteousness. The righteousness that came from the animals was only temporary. It was limited until the perfect sacrifice came along in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ.